Hi guys, I'm photographer and cinematographer Drew Geraci. I'm the owner of District 7 Media and I'm also a Sony artisan of Mimidry. I just want to thank you guys for being here today and what we're going to be talking about is how to monetize your video content. Uh, what we're talking about is taking footage that you already have on your computer or actually creating new footage and then taking that footage and selling it on stock sites so that you create a profit with it. Let's go ahead and get started. First off, why do you want to monetize content? Well, to begin with, monetizing content is great because you get this, cold hard cash. And cash is great because it allows you to live and everyone likes to have an income, right? So monetizing your content is a way to create a secondary source of income because it's stuff that you've probably already shot, it's just sitting on your hard drive and you want to get rid of it. And the best way to get rid of it is to send it out to stock sites and then to basically market it to uh, other agencies and organizations. And what I'm going to do throughout this program is try to give you the best um, ability to do that using some tips and tricks that I've learned along the way. So monetizing content in the end is just about making money off of the content that you've already created. How do I create the content to sell? Well, that's kind of the easy part because a lot of the times you've already created the content and it's literally just sitting on your hard drive. Um, what you have to think about is when you're out on a shoot or you're out somewhere visiting on vacation or you just want to go on a road trip, that's when you pop out your camera and you start taking some video. Um, and this course is really going to be about selling video content because video um, honestly sells a lot better than photos um, in today's marketplace. Um, but what I want to show you is the content that you can create can come from anything that you do. Um, as I already mentioned, you could be on vacation or on a road trip um, or just out in the public doing something and capturing uh, you know, a news event at the same time. All of these different types of videos um, that you're creating can be monetized and sold as stock footage later on in the process. What content should you focus on? Well, this is a Pandora's box of, uh, of a question because it really it can be anything. And when I say anything, it can be anything. Uh, the focus, and we'll get into this in the market research part, um, really comes down to you know kind of what your expertise is. If you are a uh, an editorial uh, videographer, you know you go out and shoot news stories all day. You can shoot B-roll of you know people, places, and things, or if you want to go out and have a much more structured studio style, um, you can actually shoot, shoot stuff in the studio and sell that as uh, stock photography or videography as well. Uh, but for the main part, it really just comes down to keeping up and creating a volume of data that you can then sell um, directly to clients or agencies and then they'll disseminate it to other people. Uh, so the focus really should just be on creating the content and getting it out the door. Now, when you're creating the content, it comes down to, well, what kind of codec should I be using? What kind of uh, you know, uh, camera should I be using to record this? And really, it can come down to anything. Um, there's been a lot of projects that I've worked on where I've used cell phone video footage, all the way up to you know, Ari Alexa or Sony Venice footage. Um, it's really anything and everything in between, and it all sells. Um, it's really just knowing your audience and how to market to that audience. But typically, if you're trying to sell to companies um, to get the highest value for your project, um, you should be using the highest um, bit rate possible um, and also the largest resolution possible because a lot of clients and customers really want to have that latitude when they're working in post to be able to pull out color information uh, and also resize and reframe and recomposite um, because they want to have that ability. So if you're shooting, I really recommend using um, a camera that has anything and everything above, whether we're talking about resolution, dynamic range, uh, bit rate, um, everything. And don't just limit it to just single you know, 24p or 30p footage. You can also think about shooting 60, 120, um, or even 240p footage, which will allow you for ultra slow motion footage. And that will, um, again, and we'll talk about this later, put you in different types of marketplaces. Um, and each one of these realms um, has a niche that you can sell in, which is fantastic. So we're going to talk about the codecs that you want to use. And if you're trying to export um, to, let's just say, a, to a stock site, you can either do H.264, which is a fully compressed file, but it's great for web viewing. Or you could do something like Apple ProRes 422 or 444. Um, and that's going to give you some of the highest quality, even with the compression that it has. Or you could even export as a raw format, such as DPX. Uh, or TIFF or um, even DNG, depending on the editor that you're using. So there's kind of a, a wide spectrum of codecs that you can use, but generally speaking, the highest quality codec that you can produce is the best one that you want um, to put out towards um, the stock sites. What content is valuable? And honestly, this is a, a loaded question because all content is valuable. You really never know what someone wants to use um, for their project. Um, there's a project that I was using on that I was looking for a specific building that I really didn't think anyone would have footage of, and you normally wouldn't take footage of it. 
and someone had it and I bought it and it was available. So it could be something as simple as just filming a, a building or a statue or a monument, um, but really the value comes down to uh, the uniqueness and the ability to obtain it. So let's just say you're out shooting somewhere very remote. The footage that you're getting, um, it's super unique and it really only happens once in a lifetime. That type of content is super valuable because everyone's gonna want it. Um, if it only happens once or twice a year or even once in a lifetime, then you know that you've captured something that's gold. And because of that, you can ask for higher, qual or higher quality prices um, on that content. But the same thing can be said about lower quality content. You know, um, there's a lot of um, industries like the medical field that just want talking heads of people um, in a in an office or um, in a operating room or, or something of that nature. Just generalized B-roll also sells quite a bit. And you also have to think about content versus volume. Um, whereas um, if you have high quality content, you can get higher prices for it, but maybe you only have a few different shots of it. But if you have a large volume of content, and let's just say it's mediocre content, it's not great, you can still retain all of the prices that you would get with the higher quality content. You just have to sell more of that content. So it really just comes down to a give and take of, you know, do you want to go with the volume or do you want to go with uniqueness um, and rarity? So really, the answer is everything is valuable. Let's talk about unique shots versus common shots, and we kind of talked about that in the last uh, segment. Um, but unique shots are shots that you really can only obtain um, once in a lifetime, or you really just have, you've gained access to a location that's never been shot before and you know no one else has shot it, that's super unique and that's very valuable. Now, common shots again are very valuable as well as long as you have volume or sequences to them. And we'll talk about that in a little bit too, but creating sequences is a great way to um, not only sell one clip, but sell multiple clips. And you can then uh, take one sequence and then um, sell it as a package and get even more money. So it really comes down to um, knowing who your audience is and researching for that, um, that particular niche because um, having the ability to shoot sequences can really benefit um, a lot of people um, in a lot of productions because if you have, let's say, a five or six shot sequence, you could then potentially sell that client five or six different sequences of the same stuff um, put together or if you have um, a whole uh, sequence lineup of footage, they could buy out all of the package. So really, there's a lot that you can do um, with unique shots versus common shots. Um, in the end, they both sell. So what content sells the most? And that's kind of a loaded question as well because all content sells. But if you're looking at it from a general standpoint, the content that sells the most, in my opinion, are those really beautiful eye candy shots. Um, shots with like great color, great lighting, uh, whether it's landscape or cityscape. Um, these type of shots really sell and they're really appealing towards different advertisers, um, especially commercials and um, different publications because let's just say there's a car commercial or there's um, you know, a medical commercial and they want to be able to use beautiful scenes of you know, either uh, just a really nice landscape or people running through a field. These are things that sell very well. So if you're kind of just staying on track with kind of creating your classic cinema, um, you'll find that you'll be able to sell um, those things relatively easy. Um, the next thing that sells is, is people. Everybody wants to have people and being able to have the releases for those people and already have them pre-shot, it's a huge um, bonus. And the next thing too is talking about um, maybe even going into other people's professions and videotaping them and then getting their rights to um, their likeness and being able to market that because that in itself is difficult as well. Um, for instance, um, there's a project I worked on with a friend who's a dentist and she had a really great meeting with some folks and she said, hey, why don't you come in and videotape us doing that? Um, and I was able to you know, videotape the whole meeting, but also get some really nice, um, beautiful shots of them just interacting with each other, um, working on uh, a patient in the office, as well as you know, just the, the typical uh, daily routine of a dentist. And then I was able to take that footage and sell it to um, other companies that wanted to use it. And since it was already pre-shot and I had the releases for it, um, it just made the process that much easier for the client. So um, those type of shots really sell well too. Um, the next thing you want to think about too is, is thinking about abstract things. Um, if you want to go for the uniqueness aspect, it's great to be able to um, provide content that you know, most clients can't get. If you were on a trip, let's just say in Iceland, and you happened to capture the Aurora Borealis, um, and there was you know, a, a horse running in the foreground, and it just looked magical, that's going to sell. There's a whole lot of things that can sell. Even the shots you don't think are going to sell um, will sell. Um, if the footage looks bad, it can sell. 
And I really want to stip or I really want to come back and say that even the footage that you've shot maybe five, ten years ago has the potential to sell, even if it's lower quality footage. Um, there are marketing organizations out there that really want to have that footage. Let's just say they want to go back in time and say, hey, do you remember back in 2010 when this happened and life was this way and people use cell phones that looked old? They want to use that content. So typically speaking, anything again can sell, um, but the higher quality content that you produce probably will sell better. Um, and if it's more modern and if it has um, anything that's going on with um, current events, that too will sell. And we'll get into that as well because that's a whole other um, thing. And especially when it comes to the marketing side of things, you really want to be looking at, well, what events are happening and what uh, can I go out and capture that's going to help benefit these events. Now let's talk about being proactive when it comes to collecting the content that you want to create. Uh, and being proactive means that you know an event's going to happen, you know that there is a specific date, place, and time that something's going to happen, but you want to go out and either um, capitalize on that it is happening or capitalize on the fact that people are going to be marketing to it. Um, for instance, the election that's coming up. I live in Washington, D.C. I know that people want to be purchasing different landscape shots of the Washington, D.C. area, as well as monuments and buildings and people. Um, so I know maybe um, six to eight months before that happens, I can go out, capture a lot of different content, and then submit it to different agencies, and they'll be like, oh, this is great. Um, since the election's coming up, we'll be happy to use this shot of the Capitol or the White House and whatnot. Um, and that's what I talk about being proactive with your uh, marketing. So if you know an event's going to be happening um, and it happens every year regularly, go out and capture it this year and then next year you can go out and then market it for other agencies and that way you're just creating a, a, a rolling ball of, uh, or a snowball effect of um, clients and content. Um, you'll always be one year ahead and you'll be able to sell and market to different clients. And really it just allows you to open up as a, a cinematographer and videographer um, to just bring in those clients um, and also create amazing content because you know exactly what's going to happen when it's going to happen. Um, that's why it's great to be proactive when it comes to collecting your content. Next we're going to talk about reaching out and networking with different types of agencies. And for a lot of people this can be difficult. Uh, when I first started in this business, I was um, in the editorial business. I worked for a newspaper. Um, so that allowed me to get networking um, between different types of uh, TV stations, newspapers, um, and other media type agencies like AP and Getty. So what you can do um, if you don't have any of these contexts is really just kind of uh, reach out to the different organizations, different companies, go onto Facebook, Twitter, um, just any kind of social media and reach out to those people that are generating and moderating the content. Um, become friends with them, um, engage with them, and try to have meaningful conversations with them. And once you do, you can then open up and then sell, start selling or start um, introducing the idea of like, hey, I've got some footage of this, this, and this. Would you be interested in running it? Um, and then I found after a while um, that one agency will tell another agency, which then tells another agency, and it kind of creates this string of agencies that you have um, in your back pocket, per se, um, that you can sell content to. Um, we work a lot with uh, NBC and ABC um, in DC, and I've got a, a, enough contacts there that I can just you know, contact someone up and say, hey, I've got footage of this. Would you be interested in running it with your story? I know you have X, Y, and Z coming up, and I think that it would work well. Uh, and that's when you kind of you know, put yourself out there um, and hope that you, know, you get a sale out of it. That's not to say you are going to get a sale out of it, but the more that you put yourself out there and the more that you show your content um, to these different types of media creators, uh, the more likely that you'll actually get your content purchased um, as stock or as licensed footage. So now we're going to talk about how to actually manage all of the footage that you have. Um, if you've ever been on a shoot and you've collected shots, uh, whether it's just B-roll or just behind the scenes, and you think, well, I want to do something with that. This is a great way to do that. You can sell behind the scenes footage. You can sell footage that you were um, you know, out on another production for, not necessarily the shots that were in the production, but let's just say you have a day off and you wanted to go out through the city and shoot something. Um, this is a great opportunity for you to do that um, and then take that footage and sell it to stock sites. Now, there's been a lot of um, you know, debate about, you know, do I use cloud-based storage or do I use local-based storage? Um, and I really want to say that there's, uh, there's positives to both of them as well as cons to both of them. For me personally, I, I own a 1.2 petabyte server um, that allows me to hold all of my footage. And since the majority of my footage is higher resolutions of 6K, 8K, and even 10K footage, you need to have more space and more volume. Uh, that being said, I think that there's avenues that you can take um, if you're just starting off to create kind of like a small dedicated NAS server that allows you to take content and pull it off onto uh, different multiple workstations at the same time. 
um, but it also allows you to store it in one centralized area. So if you have multiple computers, you can hook them all up to the same network and then download that information when you need it. And it's also great for archiving and for storage. So I use a NAS system from QNAP. They're wonderful. Um, I have three or four of them together and they're all tethered up. Um, but this allows me to store all of my footage um, in one centralized location. What works for me may not work for you, but at the same time, you can scale down and make something a little bit smaller. Let's say you have maybe 10 to 12 um, terabytes worth of content. I would speculate that maybe you get maybe a 24 or 32 terabyte um, NAS system, and that's going to allow you to store all of your data locally and have room to grow into the future. Um, if you want to take this into a more serious realm where you're creating stock um, on a full-time basis, then I would say that you want to probably have a little bit more leeway with the room that you're creating or the volume of your drives. So you'd probably be looking anywhere between the 72 um, to even 120 terabyte range. That's going to allow you to have multiple years of stock footage um, being built up and really allow you to not have to worry about that data management um, if you run out of space. Now, all of these systems, um, they vary in price. You can have anywhere from maybe uh, you know, $1,500 all the way up to $10,000 um, and beyond, depending on how much um, space you're looking for. Um, typically, if you're looking to get 120 terabytes worth of space on a, a decent server, you're probably going to spend somewhere between eight and $9,000. Um, if you're trying to get a petabyte, you know, multiply that times 10, and that's what you're really going to get. So it can be very expensive in the long run, but at the same time, the stock footage is going to pay for itself. Um, and after a three or four uh, year period of, of the returns that you're getting from the stock footage, it pays for the storage, um, and then you start making a profit on top of that. Now let's talk about cloud-based storage. Now, I like cloud-based storage, but I also think there's some caveats when it comes to cloud-based storage because you're limited really to the bandwidth that you have directly between your computer and the cloud. So let's just say you have two or three terabytes worth of information. If you're on a slow connection, uh, it's going to take a long time to get all of that information up to the cloud and store it. Um, but there's also some safety in there um, as well because you know that if you have both a local and a cloud-based storage, you know that all the content that you're creating is safe and compact um, and it's not going to be tampered with. And if something does happen that's catastrophic, you're at least going to have one backup copy somewhere. Now, I like cloud-based storage too because it allows me to send clips um, directly from the cloud-based storage to my clients. And these are for direct sales. Um, and not necessarily through stock agencies, but it allows me to uh, have that information out there on the web already so I don't have to pull it off my computer. I can just send them a direct link and it's, it's ready for, and uh, waiting for them to download. So there's definitely some benefits to cloud-based storage, but I would also um, err on the side of caution saying that if the cloud-based storage does fail, uh, nine times out of ten, there's no guarantee that there's going to be a backup for that because um, agencies like Microsoft and Amazon, they don't guarantee your, your data. So if something happens on their side where it fails and the data is deleted, it's gone. And there's really no recourse that you can take to get that information back. So it's always good to keep a local copy um, on your hard drive or on your NAS system. So um, pros and cons to both. Now, when it comes to data management software, there's only a few things that I like to use. Um, one, if you're on a budget and you don't have anything, um, you can use Adobe Bridge. And Adobe Bridge is great because you can go in and you can create and collect metadata for all of your footage. You can compile it, put it into one small um, folder, and you have it there, and it's compact, ready to go. But if you want something that's a little bit more um, uh, robust and allows you to actually see the footage and collection, do better search engine um, optimizations, um, tagging, and things like that. Um, I use a program called uh, the Video Cataloger. And it's fantastic because it really allows you to go in and uh, put all the metadata to a, to a video clip. It allows you to add star ratings. It allows you to add unique identifiers, tags. And all this information can be given to different stock sites uh, when you want to upload your content. Next, I'm going to demonstrate how the Fast Video Catalog works. And it's probably one of the most simplest programs to use. It's also free. There is a version that you can purchase, but the free version works just as well. I'm going to open this up. You can see it loading. And it's pretty intuitive as to the layout and how to actually um, get from one point to the next point. But the first thing I want to do is we want to add some videos to our catalog. And this is going to be the main screen that you'll see when it first opens. So the first thing you want to do is let's say you've already got a folder. In this case, I've got a desktop uh, with three clips that I want to add to um, our catalog. And what I'm going to do is just take these clips. I'm going to drag and drop them right here. And you can see that they have been into or ingested into the catalog. 
from here we can set the thumbnail generation interval and I think the uh, the five seconds one is probably the best so what that means it's gonna take a thumbnail um, still frame from every five seconds of footage um, that you see so you can see the uh, the footage um, in its entirety realistically next we'll open up the fill out shared properties tab and this is where we can add keywords um, or make up new keywords now there's some that we can already have but we can come in here and type in things like 8k and add that or drone footage or landscape and these keywords really should correlate to whatever the footage is that you're using um, I would say that you should uh, compartmentalize your footage uh, so if you have clips that are all from say one location you can just add all of the same metadata and then go in individually and add in specific metadata but this way you can add a more broader generalization um, metadata to it um, that way it's easier to uh, work out in the long run um, so after that, we can set the ratings for this. If we think this footage is going to be used for exclusive use or if it's going to be used for royalty-free, we can add the rating here. Um, generally speaking, if I do want to make this footage available for exclusive use, I'll put it at five star. And if I think it's for royalty-free or it's just not that great, I'll just set it for one star. So there's just a difference between one star footage uh, and five star footage. Um, next, you can type in um, links or descriptions about anything that you want. Um, if you want to get super detailed about it, um, we can add descriptions for each one of these shots that we just added. Uh, and then after that's done, we just scroll down here and we click start. And what it's going to do is it's going to take that information, compile all the metadata into the video, uh, and then create a new catalog for it. And once that's done, we can go to our video catalog down here and actually see that footage. Great. So it's completed. I'm going to click catalog and as you can see we've got all of these photos and all this video here and these are all from scenes that I've already pre-ingested and this particular folder set was for um, most of my shots that are in uh, China so as you can see I've got uh, around 250 to 258 different shots now our new shots are going to be right down here and I can click on this and it gives me a nice little um, thumbnail build out of what we can see in this video. Um, if you have a long video like this one, this is a, a, a three minute long video and we have the ability to see everything that's going on within those three minutes. Um, and then this one is just um, a standard one single shot. So um, if we wanted to, we can click on it, double click it, and down here in the preview bin, we'll get a, a nice little preview of it. Or we can go into here, and it'll actually play with full audio um, the content that you're creating. So this is a great way for you to actually see the footage live if you wanted to. Um, and this is fantastic because if you wanted to give this to a client, you could easily just type in um, in the search bar up here, dun, 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 search for videos, if I wanted to type in China. And then I come back over to my video catalog, and it's now displaying everything that's been um, added with the China tag to it. Let's just go back. I'm going to go back to my search index and I'm going to reset this. Come back to those clips that we just made. In this case I'm going to change the metadata on my um, Shadows of the City clips. In the description so I can say Kennedy Center Shadows Light Play Sweeping Shadows dark, moody, and we can add any kind of information we want to the metadata and this is what's going to allow us to search for it later on uh, and allow us to actually find it without having to search through all of these different videos. So we can come back over here, I can type in Kennedy, come back here and there's our, our footage. So this is a great way to organize and categorize uh, your footage um, if you've got a large volume of footage. And in this case I like to make little uh, catalogs of maybe 500 to a thousand um, different shots that way I can just easily search now you can combine these later on and get one giant massive catalog which is fantastic because it allows you to search for your entire database uh, but I do like to make things a little more organized in the sense that I like to compartmentalize where my footage is from that way it's easier um, to find and there's less hassles about missing links and things like that but this is just kind of the basic loadout this program is free um, you can purchase it, and if you do unlock it, it just removes some of the ads from the, um, uh, from the program. Uh, but otherwise, it works 100% without actually having to purchase anything. And this is a great way for you to just organize your footage, um, be able to come through, see it, 
um, live and then find the location and then send it out to either stock agencies or directly to clients. If you want to download this program, you can go to fastvideocatalogger.com and easily download it for free. Now, the biggest important thing when you're creating stock is creating the metadata. The more information that you can put out on the, the subject that you're shooting, the better. So let's just say you've got a skyline of New York City. You want to put as much information in there as possible. And this could be anything like talking about, well, it's dark, it's moody, there's lights, cars whizzing by, uh, rain, um, daytime, nighttime, 4K, 8K, 10K, talk about resolution, talk about the different color bit. Um, all of these different types of metadata um, or all the type of different metadata information needs to be in the scene. The more information you can put out, the more information that can be found when it goes online to be searched. Um, so let's just say someone's looking for a rainy day in Manhattan. Um, make sure that you put that kind of information in your, um, your metadata because that's what people are going to be searching for. So you really want to be taking the mindset of someone that's looking for the footage when you're categorizing um, and tagging your footage because it's easy to say, okay, it's a daytime shot of a city, but get a little more specific. It's a um, beautiful daytime sh shot with uh, bright blue sky and um, you know, cars and people are walking in the foreground. The more detail you can give, the better. So which sites work the best? And this again, much like the questions at the beginning, it's kind of loaded because there's lots of different caveats for each site. Um, each is good and bad in their own way, um, but I want you guys ultimately to have the, the, um, the option to choose whatever uh, site you want to use. So here's a list of 10 sites that uh, I think are probably the most popular out there right now. And there's, uh, there's a difference between some stock sites, some are subscription-based and others are just license-based. Um, and some are royalty free and some are rights managed and we'll get into talking about what those are um, in a little bit but all of them boil down to just one thing and that comes down to how much of a percentage are you getting back from each of these locations so looking at this list you know we've got art list we've got pond 5 we've got getty nimia adobe dissolve vimeo um, direct website sales as well as film stock and iStock. these are all sites that are just pretty basic when it comes to creating stock but they also allow you to um, sell your stock without having to have um, too much of a portfolio so you can get started right away. Um, there are some site, sites like Dissolve that you can only be invited to the stock site. Um, you can't, you have to submit a portfolio and if they have the content or if you have the content that they're looking for, then they'll accept you. So there's kind of a, um, an entry to each one of these areas. So what percentage should you be getting if you're selling stock? Well, the first thing you want to think about is um, how much time and money have you invested into creating this stock footage? If you've you know, spent ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 going out there creating it yourself, you really want to be looking for an agency that's going to give you the highest return on that footage. Now, if you're just randomly going out, let's just say you got your camera and you want to just take some random shots of a city um, or an event happening, uh, maybe the percentage is lower. But ultimately, you want to go for the highest possible percentage because that just means the more return you're going to get on the product that you're um, selling. So here are the stock site percentages. Um, everything is broken down into three different categories. You've got green, yellow, and red. Green is the best. Yellow is kind of the middle ground. And red is something that I would probably stay away from. A lot of the red ones are subscription-based. And subscription-based are kind of bad because you don't actually get a, um, a lump sum of money. You only get a small percentage of what the subscription um, purchase is. So let's just say the subscription for a client is um, $59 a year unlimited and someone purchases a clip from there with that subscription. That means you're realistically only going to get a few cents and maybe if you're lucky a dollar on the, on the footage that you're selling. Um, whereas if you're getting truly licensed footage, whether it's royalty free or uh, rights managed, you're going to be getting anywhere between 30 and 60% just depending on the kind of content that you're selling. So Pond5 is really a great starter website to start selling content on because it gives you a pretty high percentage of return, 30 to 40% starting off with the ability to go up to 60 depending on how exclusive the content is. Some stock sites have the uh, option to do exclusive only, which means the content that you're selling is exclusively to that um, or is exclusive to that particular stock site. Uh, and it means you can't sell it anywhere else, but it also means that you'll get a bigger percentage back. So things like Pond5 and Nimia and Direct Sales are going to give you the best uh, sale and the best bang for your buck because um, it's exclusive content. And particularly um, when it comes to uh, unique content, I would say you want to have it, that exclusivity because that's just going to give you the highest return um, on the content that you're selling. 
Now, something like Getty, um, iStock, and Vimeo are what I would call variable because it really just depends on the terms that you're licensing from. Um, and a lot of the times, I think Getty is just now full uh, royalty free now. They don't do rights managed as much. And that's kind of a bummer because rights managed usually gives you a much higher profit at the end because you can ask more because the footage is um, being licensed to um, the user on a term base rather than on an unlimited base. Um, but it's okay. If we're doing volume based sales, then going to Pond5 um, or even Adobe and iStock, it's acceptable because let's just say you have 10,000 clips, you throw them all up there and you can maybe make 10 to $15 per clip, you're going to walk away at the end of the year um, with possibility of having tens of thousands of dollars in your account. Um, whereas if you go with um, some of the higher ones like Direct Sale or Nimia, uh, it could take a while to sell a single clip, but you could sell a single clip that's $1,500 all the way up to $10,000 for a single clip. Um, and it's rights managed, which means that there's terms involved with that. And there's a potential uh, for having recurring payments to that because it's being used in a product. So there's a big difference between royalty free and rights managed. And that's what we're going to be talking about next. When you want to choose between rights managed and royalty free, there's quite a big difference between the two. And let's just break that down for you. Uh, rights managed content usually has that more unique content, that content you can't get anywhere else. Um, and it's content that it, it looks beautiful, it's technically correct, um, it looks cinematic, and um, it's something that you want to be able to display um, for a product uh, that no one else has. Um, it has a higher value to that, and what you do is you actually set terms for the use of that in a license agreement. And that license agreement could um, constitute um, you know, a, a one-year term or a six-month term. Uh, it could be for um, all media or worldwide. It could be in perpetuity. Um, there's a whole different set of variables that go into um, creating the license, and that is ultimately what drives the price up or down uh, when it comes to rights managed. When we talk about royalty free, you're basically giving up your entire rights to that image because the person can use it as many times as they want in as many different projects as they want, and they only have to pay the fee once. Um, and that's okay if the footage is low quality, um, but if you have higher quality content, something that is super unique, you really don't want to do royalty free because it's just going to mean that you're getting a very low return on something that's high quality. Uh, and that's why you really want to take that footage and put it into an exclusive um, rights managed um, kind of stock site or even just direct sales because um, you want to save that premium content for the best possible price. Now the low quality content, let's just say you're out on a shoot and you captured some birds flying, put it up there. Um, it could be anywhere between 10 to 20 seconds long, but it could also sell a thousand times because everybody wants to use the footage because it's common. Um, and you could end up making a couple hundred or thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars on that. Um, but when it comes to royalty free, it's really all about volume. So the more information and the more content that you can put out there at royalty free, the higher your sales are going to be. Licensing terms are important, especially for rights managed products, because you want to be able to have all those terms set into a signed contract so that um, the end user and you know exactly when a product is supposed to be used and when it's not supposed to be used. So we were talking about the distribution medium, the length of use, the exclusivity, the region, the type, and the number of viewers. In today's realm, um, the number of viewers are super important because let's just say you're licensing to a company that is putting it out into social media. If they have a rather, relatively small um, pool of people, um, the price is going to be lower. But if they have a much higher um, volume of people, like let's just say over a million followers, the price needs to be a little bit higher because that means it's going to be reaching more eyes and that content um, is important to the client. So you also want to think about the distribution mediums. Um, social media is probably one of the highest uh, mediums that there are today. Um, but you also have feature film, editorial, and commercial. Commercial work is where um, you can also get a very high um, price for your content because it's, using, it's being used commercially. Um, and generally speaking, um, you're talking about maybe $2,500 to $6,000 um, for just a few seconds of, of footage, uh, just depending on what the clip is that you're using. And then the length of use is also important because um, you want to be able to stipulate to the client, okay, you only have six months to a year to use this, or two years, four years, five years, ten years, or in perpetuity. Um, and all of this is you know, contractually based. But the longer term the use, uh, the higher the value would be. So if someone only wants to use it for six months, um, it could be the difference between uh, a couple hundred or a couple thousand dollars versus perpetuity, which is forever, uh, which means that you want to be able to be paid for that content if it's being put out into the universe um, forever. 
Um, next comes exclusivity. Uh, when it comes to doing rights managed, exclusivity is a huge uh, or has a huge impact on the value of the work. If something is, is, is exclusive, it means that company or that commercial is only going to be the one, it's going to be the only ones that can use that footage, uh, which means that it, it, it touts a much higher value than a non exclusive uh, piece of footage. So think about that when you're doing your pricing. If you're using a company like Nimia, Nimia puts all this information and calculates it um, right in front of you so you don't really have to think about it. Um, but if you're doing direct sales, you can then you know, put your own um, amount in there, thinking about the time, the effort, the amount of uh, you know, time spent creating it, as well as you know, how much did it cost to make this. You, know, you spend uh, thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars on cameras and equipment um, to go out and shoot this. That all needs to be put into the price um, of your footage when you're selling it. The biggest thing you can do as a cinematographer, a videographer, is protecting the work that you create. Um, even if you're only creating work um, for yourself and you're putting it out on the web, it's really important that you copyright that footage. Uh, and there's been many instances where I've had work stolen off of just personal videos of mine because people want to use it and they use it for commercial purposes. So it's important that you take that footage, um, put it onto a CD, or I think now you can actually do a USB drive, send it off to the copyright office and get it um, officially copywritten. So if and when someone does steal your work, you're able to um, collect monetary damages on top of copyright damages that that person um, has taken against you. So it's really important that um, if you have the ability to, to find some legal representation, um, to also create a, a full um, licensing document or licensing agreement for clients. That way it's standardized and if you do direct sales, you'll always have that file available to create the terms and the distribution and everything um, in between so that they know what's happening and that it covers both you and them and there's liability there. It's also important to make sure that you have a solid license agreement. You want to make sure that your client knows exactly how the footage can be used, where and when it can be used, and et cetera. So there's a lot of different things that, go in, or that are involved with this, but it's also great in, to make sure that you have legal representation if and when someone steals your work. The best thing you can do as a videographer is putting out personal projects. If you, you know, don't want to contact agencies and you don't want to um, do the legwork of networking all these different people and selling your content to people, what you can do is put out personal projects. And for me, I found that if I put out a personal project, I'll almost instantly get some type of licensing request, especially if the content um, is engaging and it's beautiful. Um, but I think that's why it's really important to put out personal projects. Um, let's just say you're working on something um, that no one else has seen before. You put it out there, um, it gets a couple hundred thousand views or even a million views. That's content that can be monetized. Um, via stock sites or direct sales. So it's important that you continually put out content, even if it's just a single clip um, or a video. Um, you really just want to keep people engaged with the content that you're creating um, so that they are, again, engaged with you and then are interested in the footage that you have because they could have a project where they want to use that footage. And if they see that you have it, they'll come to you directly um, and they'll purchase it. So if you're doing nothing to market yourself on social media or on a website, you're doing a disservice to yourself because you really probably won't end up selling anything. But if you go out there, you put it out to the world, you'll, you let people know that the footage is available for licensing, you're probably going to get a few uh, bites here and there. Um, and the more footage that you put out and the more footage, uh, the more consistent you are with putting that footage out, the more likely that you're going to sell something in the future. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I know there's a lot on this topic, but again, I really appreciate you guys coming out today. And uh, as always, happy shooting.